Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Rick West. Rick, are you ready to be great today? Jason, man, I am ready. So happy to be here with you today. Rick is the CEO and founder of Field Agents, where you're a click away from stores and shoppers everywhere. Field Agent connects brands, retailers, and AGs with customers across the country and around the world to help you win at retail. Rick, thanks again for being here. I really appreciate it. You bet. So, Rick, we're going to start with something personal first. Talk to me about how being a granddaddy has changed your life or impacted you. You know, if, if uh, you know, I'm a storyteller at heart, Jason. And if I go back and look at, you know, my kids growing up and the way I've grown up, um, I grew up around grandparents. And then when we moved away, we've lived, you know, multiple places in the United States. We lived in Asia for a while. Uh, I didn't realize what it was like not to have my kids grow up like next door to their grandparents. And so the impact for me recently has been uh, just to realize the, the time that you have as a grandparent is different than a parent because you just have a different pace, a different perspective, and to look in those little eyes differently at my age. And it's just impacted me to know that when you think of legacies and what you're going to leave behind, my relationships on these kids as grandkids might be as much or more than I have with my kids. And that's just an awesome responsibility. I know with me, my grandparents were real close. I was going to spend summers with them, you know, lots of time with them. And they both died when I was 11 child, right? So even to this day, like if someone works for me, they say, hey, my grandparents sick or whatever. I'm like, what are you doing here? Take your ass and go to your grandparents, right? So that's always like a soft heart in my heart forever, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so, so true. And you, you just realize, you see that little smile on their face. And, and listen, you like to have kids. Kids are okay. But you, know, you have to have kids to get to the grandkids thing. But man, grandkids yeah. are amazing. Yeah. Those are me about a long time ago where it's like, if, if you're a parent, you know, you're strict with your kids, you know, none of this, none of that, you know, if you're a grandparent, you're serving your, your grandkids, like, you know, ice cream and cake for breakfast, you know, there's a, a plate, whatever they want to do, right? Bring it on. <laughs> and your kids are like, where was this person at when I was a kid? Oh, yeah. So how, how old are your grandkids? Uh, I have a five-year-old granddaughter and a three-year-old grandson. Oh, man, that's the, per to me, that's a perfect age for a kid, right? Three it's to fantastic. five. They're kind of independent. They still look up to you a little bit, you know. They're not yeah. a preteen yet, you know. That's just a perfect age. They're, 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 they're potty trained, you know. They can take care of themselves. Exactly. You get it. That's a perfect age. So next, uh, talk about your, your living experiences in Hong Kong and Bangkok and how long were you in each place? Yeah, yeah. So as if, if you're an entrepreneur listening here and you, you just live in my background, is I, I lived in the, the corporate world and the corporate world was with Procter & Gamble. And it took me to a couple of places in the United States, but I spent two years in Hong Kong and a year in Bangkok. And you, you learn a couple of things from that, uh, Jason. And, and the first being that I came from a small town, Eastern Kentucky, and you think you're kind of the, you know, big fish, small town, if, if small, small pond with, within PNG. It wasn't necessarily a big Smith fish, but it wasn't a small one either. But when you get to a place like Hong Kong, where you've got 4 million people, just all crammed together and the massive amounts of folks that are going on, you started to just to realize just how insignificant you are to some degree. So number one, from a business standpoint, and most people may not realize this, but within Asia, and I had the Asian area from really Japan, Philippines, Korea, all the way down to Australia, New Zealand, uh, it was still like the wild, wild west. I mean, they were just beginning to implement UPCs in some of the countries. Uh, Western comp com companies were just coming into uh, southern part of China and the, the northwest part of China. And, you know, those cities were popping up and those international companies were coming in. And so we really had to get back to a lot of basics. So what I realized was coming into it from an experience standpoint is that while you're coming in trying to, to help a local distributor or a local company be able to perform, more importantly, it was helping the international companies coming in, how to understand to work with local locals. And so it was a really interesting experience for me to have that local engagement to help them move up, to really bring their, their game up high, but also working with the international companies coming in, helping them understand, says, listen, these people have been doing work like this for a thousand years. It's not going to change overnight. And together we can all become better. So it was a really cool experience. And um, and, and listen, the people were amazing. The changes, uh, we go back to Bangkok in a second. Absolutely love living in Thailand. The people were amazing. Uh, but one of those experiences, Jason, that I probably uh, refer to almost daily. 
Yeah, so when I was in the Army, I was in Korea for three years. I, I, I was able to bring my family, right? And that's like in 2005. And like so many people, there are like 10, 14 million people in the city. And what people in America don't realize, at least in Seoul, Korea, the tech is so advanced, right? We got there, like big screen TVs on top of, of high skyscrapers, like uh, keyless entries to your homes. Like this, a, the, it's just amazing how advanced they are compared to the states as far as tech, oh, yeah. tech is. Even like in, when I was, so I was there 95, so sorry, 90, 98 through 2001. And uh, India is a good example. I'm in India. And you realize that literally every person, whether you're in a hut or you're in a high rise, had a cell phone. And, and like, it, it was just, it was just crazy, right? Because even in the States and cell phones were coming in, but they were still pretty big and the technology was there. And what you realized was they said, hey, we made a decision 10, 15 years ago not to invest in landline infrastructure because for us to scale with you know hundreds of billions of people into these small homes, it was never gonna pay out. So they went digital high tech first and we were really pretty far behind. Uh, and so that to your point was you underestimate even in a second world country, how high it advanced they can be from a technology standpoint, even though from a best practices standpoint, have a lot to grow on. Yeah, I could be wrong, but I think the stats show that like third world countries actually have a higher density of cell phone usage or mobile stuff than first world countries, I think. Would not surprise me at all. Yeah, so while in Korea, so we actually went to Thailand twice. My wife has a, her cousin lives in Thailand. Mm -hmm. So he was in the Air Force of the 70s during Vietnam. This guy that I stayed in Thailand, you know, got a Thailand family. We went there twice. He lives in a town called Pratchettbury, like three hours east of Bangkok. We had to see the real Thailand, of course, all the tourist stuff. Just like, man, like you said, I will go back in a minute. Just the people yeah. there, the food, that's a just amazing experience. It's fantastic. Yeah. And I think some of you Americans miss out on that travel and seeing different things, right? Like me, I, I got friends from Odessa, Texas, still never left Odessa, Texas. They think going out of town is going to Dallas, right? And I think so many, <laughs> I think so many people miss this aspect of the world, right? Well, what it really is, and again, if you're you know entrepreneurial listening and you, you think of it in terms of, hey, I've got this product, I've got this service, and I've talked to this group of people. And listen, Jason, you and I both know one of the worst mistakes you can ever make is to ask your mom, your dad, your, your spouse, and your friend what they think about your product because they're going to tell you your baby's really cute. And listen, your baby's ugly. You think it's cute, it's ugly. What you start to realize is that when you get outside of Odessa, you get outside of Dallas, you get into the world, if you truly want to be an entrepreneur that can scale, whether we're talking about Texas versus Seattle or Seattle versus Hong Kong, to get that type of exposure and your product exposed to those people to give your input in, then you really begin to understand what it's gonna to take to scale, what features it's gonna really require. And you're gonna find out whether you've got a true you know, service or a great product or not. Because again, your, your family is always gonna tell you you're cute. Now, the bad thing is if your family says your idea is horrible, you know, that's really bad. Yeah. You're really bad, walk away fast. So since you brought up, let's talk about idea validation for a minute, because I think so many entrepreneurs, like you said, they have this idea, they start building a product, start building a platform, you know, whatever the case may be, and they talk to no one, right? right. And so many people are doing that. How do we stop this? Because, you know, they end up wasting like hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. One, you know, toward the end of our show today, your program today, uh, would love to offer up an opportunity for entrepreneurs to use the work that we do to be able to validate some concepts. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but I'm going to give you the, the best piece of advice that I was ever given, ever given to this day, best gift as an entrepreneur, uh, was a, by a guy by the name of Dr. Stephen Graves. So Steve Graves in the area. So we're all in, we're about a weekend, we, you know, we're starting, you know, we've left the big corporate world and we're going to start this, you know, shopper marketing company. And he sets us down. We all got our moleskin. We got our pins, man, we're writing down stuff. And he said, guys, you are only as good as you invoice and collect. If you can't do that, you're starting an expensive hobby. And we just looked at him. He said, so you can do all the research you want and you need to, you need to talk to a bunch of people, you should. And you can have the most amazing product, but eventually you got to stop, stop iterating, stop, stop doing everything. Get your product to the 80-20 and you need to find out if a complete stranger will pay you for that product. If they will, you got something. If they won't, go back and iterate again. But you've got to get to the point 
to where no one's buying it for a favor. They're not buying it because you're giving it away for free. They're buying it because they see the features and the attributes of that. And I'm telling you, for so many entrepreneurs, Jason, that are out there today, they're spending a ton of money iterating on their product, and they should. But you finally get to a point where you just got to stop. And you got to go out and find if someone's going to buy this thing. Now, if you take that thing full circle, you know, kind of you can, you're spending money iterating product. Uh, I remember the guy by the name of Guy Kawasaki. Yeah, I, I, know, I know who that is. Yeah, be considered like, you know, the original, you know, guy that's going to be, you know, driving, you know, Apple computers. And he talked about this engagement with the original Macintosh. And he said, listen, when we launched this thing, we launched it. It had no hard drive. Okay. Had no Ethernet. It didn't have Wi-Fi. Uh, it was just a really basic machine that had an amazing looking screen and interesting graphics. And we launched it and it was a piece of crap. And he just pauses. He said, but it was a revolutionary piece of crap. <laughs> and what I found was when I launched that piece of crap, that I got all this feedback back from customers. And he said, of all the things we spent time on, the one thing that every customer wanted more of was the thing that we put onto the Macintosh about a week before we launched it, which was the color graphics drawing package. We spent all this time on spreadsheets and databases and word processing, but man, they love the fact we could do that. He said, had we waited for Ethernet and you know, multiple things of RAM and different hard drives and all this amazing stuff that we thought was smart, we would have never had that product in front of us. He said, now I'm not saying ship crap. He said, but it's really elements of crappiness, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a, still a good product. I mean, if you remember back in the days, that original Mac was good product, but it's nothing compared to what you see today. So his point is, which is driving down Steve Graves' point, is that if you've got something and you truly believe you've got something, get it 70, 80%, get it in the hands of strangers, let them use it. They're gonna give you feedback that you never would have thought on your own. They're going to give you perspective that you could not, you know, pay for, and you're going to find out really quickly what you've got or what you don't have. And that's my advice to any entrepreneur, whether it's a product or a service. Yeah, you raised some great points, Rick. So a few things. One is, uh, I think Reed Hoffman, like the founder of LinkedIn, he always says, you know, if, if you ship your product, you're not embarrassed. You shipped it too late, you know, because you got to get the user feedback. And I remember hearing a reading somewhere where someone said, if you can get to 10 customers who don't know you at all, like they had no idea who you are, you get 10 customers who buy from you who don't know you, you might have something. Exactly. I think it's important, important. Those things are important too. Yeah. And, but and again, yeah. but your entrepreneurs listening, for the, but they're like, yeah, but Jason, you don't understand. I'm almost there. Because yeah. when I finish this, it's going to be amazing. And you're like, man, you, you, again, it, it's one thing to ship a product that's 60% there. That's, you don't send that crap out. But when you get to that 80, 85, and when you get to that point, especially early on, you got to get that beta out. You got to get that first piece out as quick as you can. So what are you talking about this? So I was in a group session yesterday because I'm part of YC Startup School. And someone said this, I think it makes a lot of sense. A lot of entrepreneurs don't want to get feedback because they know deep in the heart what they're building is crap and is, is, is not a need for it. And there's no, they're not really solving a problem. And they know that in their heart and they know if they ask users, the user's going to confirm that to them. There's a lot of truth in that. Now, if you're, uh, are, are you a Shark Tank fan? Yeah, yeah, I watch it once in a while. Right. So, so every now and then you'll see someone saying, and, and it, Mark Cuban says this, hey, I love you, Jason. Your product is a piece of crap, but I'm going to give you the money you're looking for. As long as you agree, you're not going to work on that. You're going to work on this idea because I love you and what you've built. And they're like, I can't do it. Every now and then you hear one, someone say, man, I'm in. Yeah. And that's when, because they could see it, that the entrepreneurs got it. Everything's required, but you're so bought into the, how cute your baby is. You're not realizing kind of that the forest for the trees kind of thing. So I, I love the analogy. And again, as you know, all analogies fall apart at about 80%. There's exceptions to every rule, but for the most part, I think people hold on too tight. What's your advice on this? Like, you know, the entrepreneurs out there and they know they need to start making calls. They need to start talking to users, start doing the sales. For a reason, always have an excuse not to do it, right? Either because like, it's not because they, they know how to do sales. They took all the classes. They have the training. They're just like, you know, I'll do something else. I'll make a phone call tomorrow. How do you convince entrepreneurs, no, make those calls for now. Reach out to people now. I think it goes back to strengths and weaknesses. Um, if that really is you and you can't, like, um, let me give me another analogy. 
Um, my wife and I, we used to have a shopper research firm. Uh, she was the qualitative person, amazing gift to engage. You know, Jason, when you leave, you think she's like your best friend and just the eye contact, the engagement. And she was a great, you know, could just ask those questions. When it came time to qualitative and focus groups, you want to be me nowhere near that place. Because I walk in and say, hey, Jason, this is an awesome product, right? Don't you, don't you love this, Jason? Don't you love it? And she'd be like, what do you do? And you can't lead them. So I think as an entrepreneur, you reached this point and said, you know, it is not my role to take this to strangers. It is not my role to get it in front of people because I'm too close to it and I can't. And so find that person in your life that has really nothing invested in, whether it's a friend or, or some coworker over here. Now you may get the people in the room for a focus group or you may get the person to convince you to come in for lunch, but and you got to step back if you're too close to it and let another person, it might be the best 500 bucks you've ever given a friend to just go have a conversation about your product and they record it and you get the feedback. So it doesn't have to always be you for everything, especially when it comes to getting feedback. Rick, next talk about your process, your decision-making process of going from Parker Gamble to joining the world of startups. I think a lot of that had to do, Jason, with... Um, Kind of my upbringing, always, you know, not really an entrepreneur, but just dabbling and working and getting things done. And it, it's been about 17 years of PNG. Again, it was in Asia at the time. And in many cases, living and working in Hong Kong and in Bangkok was very much like being an entrepreneur. Uh, I wasn't sitting in a cubicle printing out reports. And I mean, I was with customers, I was out, you're making decisions, nothing was standardized. So you're always working on the fly. So you started to get that type of momentum. And then what I realized was that all roads led back to Cincinnati. And that's not a bad thing. But it was going to lead me back to working in a cubicle within a specific department, and kind of taking me away from that frontline experience of working. And if I, if I learned anything about myself in Asia, was that I really, really enjoyed engaging customers and solving problems, engaging, engaging customers, solving problems. And so once you get a taste of that and you get some autonomy, it's really, really hard to go back. Now, what blessed us, my, my wife and the two other co-founders that we started things is that uh, PNG was looking for a couple thousand volunteers to separate. And we said, sure, you know, we'll raise our hand. And so they relocated me back from Thailand to the States uh, they gave us all a separation package and we used that as angel money, used it as seed money. So for the first you know, six, nine months, we didn't have to worry about taking an income in. We used that money to go fund our business to get it started. Uh, and that was really, I don't say necessarily the, the tipping point for us, but once we realized that, we knew we could kind of jump in this thing together. So Rick, have, have all your startups been self-funded or have you raised, have to raise money for any of them? Uh, everything was self-funded um, until about four years into field agent. And then we took on a series A. Um, what we were realizing is that to scale to the next level for us, um, we had enough competition coming in and we were first to market, first app that paid in iTunes, the first app that would pay you to do a task. And within you know six, nine months, you had guys in Silicon Valley just spinning up companies saying the same thing. Uh, and we knew after a couple of years, we needed some, some funding to go scale it. So we took on a series A, then a follow-on investment about two years later, but we've kind of been bootstrapping for the last five years after that. So took the funding, drove it, but we're in a pretty good place now. Do you have any advice for entrepreneurs looking to fundraise, like what they do not to do? Of course, advice out there, you know, don't do this, do this, you know, what, what's your point of view on that? Yeah. Uh, I think practically speaking, Jason, you've got to decide. And again, that's why Shark Tank for all it is that's wrong with it, there's so much right with it, which is at some point in time, you've got to decide if I've proven, it, it's the, um, if you ever listen to uh, Sangram, the guy that started Terminus, he's got a, a great podcast called The Move, and or it used to be called Flip My Funnel, but he, he takes you down this path is that you've got to have a problem market fit, a product market fit, and a platform market fit. If you truly believe you solved a problem, which is what we did, we knew we'd solved a problem, and we had people buying our product in scale, once you reach that point, getting funding, I think, is a really, really healthy conversation to have because it can help you scale so that 
you being a hundred percent owner of a million dollar business, you know, the other old adage goes versus a 50% owner in a hundred million dollar business. Yeah. Yes. But, but you can't have that conversation when you're still trying to figure out if you're solving a problem, you're trying to figure out if I really have a product or not, because then you're going to come in and when they give you money, instead of, you know, going from a hundred percent to 50, you might go from hundred to 20 and they, you just get so diluted. So my encouragement, and this is why you see people use friends and family and other things. How do you get to a point where you spend all your time with the problem and product market fit, and then the platform and the scaling would be funding? And that's really what I think it's a fair conversation to have. Uh, taking money for operations is like the worst thing you can do. Taking money off the table for any other reason other than scaling uh, is just a recipe for a dilution, and it's going to get you to a very, very bad place. Yeah, I think a challenge, I think a lot of entrepreneurs definitely raised money too early, right? But I think the yeah. challenge is there's a lot of VCs out there who will say, come to us early, come with your idea. But what they really need to say is, come, come to us with an idea if we already know you, right? If we already know you, then we're right. your idea. They feel to say, well, if you're Joe Blow from, you know, Denver, Colorado, I don't know you are, some random idea. We're not going to probably not explain your idea. But if you're like, you know, the cousin of Mark Zuckerberg, yeah, come on down and just give you a couple million dollars, right? I think they don't, they don't fill it out. Uh, but Jason, it's hard for all of us. And so it's one thing to be an entrepreneur when you're 21, you have no money at all, you'll take any dime you can get, right? It's another thing where you've been working the corporate world for 10 years and you've got a family or you're established, you're, you're a young single person, and you've got a little bit of retirement set in there, you've got some savings and you've got this lifestyle that's in front of you. Then my point to them is that if you really believe in this, are you willing to sacrifice the niceties of the world to go really invest in the, the product and show me how important this is to you? And I've talked to, I mean, I don't know, it's probably been about six months with COVID. It's hard to remember how long it's been, but I was talking to this one person, he was looking for money. I'm like, you're not out there selling it. You haven't like sold, not sold every, but you don't have really everything in. And you're wanting me to bet on that you've solved a problem that you haven't proven that you've got a product. And so he said, man, all I need is a hundred thousand dollars to keep working on this. I'm like, you're just talking to the wrong guy here, man. That, that's, that's yeah. the wrong. And there's but, a lot of people out there like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and I think some, some degrees business schools hurt them because they tell them you're smart. You can do anything. Just go get funded. You can go drive this thing. Well, those are great textbook conversations, but those real world examples, Jason, are ones that have amazing solution to a problem. They've got a product that's ready to go and people put a hundred thousand, a million, five million into it and they scale it. The guys that get money up front, in my experience, they're normally getting the money because the people coming in already know them. They're brilliant and they're investing in them because they know the work ethic, they know their, their ideals of where they are. And man, I'm going to get behind of you. I see an inkling of the problem you're going to solve, but that's not for 22 year old Joe or Sue. <laughs> I appreciate that, but you should go talk to your mom and dad for that money. I mean, yeah. and, and see if they really want to you know, take your inheritance and put it into a product that you're not sure anyone wants to buy. Hey, do you know who Jason Kalkanis is? This, the super angel of the Bay Area? I do not. So he has a podcast called This Week in Startups. And he was talking about, this is like maybe a couple of years ago, where he invested like $100,000 in like this founder, right? This founder team. And the founder team came back six months later. Hey, we spent the money. We don't have any, you know, the product is failing. But we learned a lot. Can we get some more money? He was like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, you learn a lot. Like, what good does that do me, right? Like, and yeah. And then, and, so so if, you're, if you're listening and you're 30 or you're 40, let's say you're, you're 40, you got all this stuff going on. Are you willing for a season to work nights and weekends while you keep your day job, sacrifice other things, invest your own money, skip your vacation, go drive something to get your product to where someone else will go buy it. You see that person and they've got that kind of experience. You'd be surprised how quickly you get a hundred grand, 500 grand from a VC angel guy that says, I see the work ethic. I see how smart you are. You've invested in this. You solved a problem you can get that money, but you, you can't put the cart before the horse, man. You've got to solve a problem. You got to have a product fit. Well, people realize the money's out there, right? Cause like 2020 during COVID money, VCs will invest more money than history or ever. 2021, mm -hmm. they broke it again. Don't path, you know, the break it again in 2022. The money's out there. Got any of you some VCs, but I'll say you have to have like some more than an idea. You gotta, you gotta show something, you know, 
because right. the money's there. They have to invest it in something, you know? Exactly. And so, again, it goes back to the product piece. Now, again, you're always going to have exceptions to that where so-and-so got funded. But I guarantee you, listen, I and, and I firmly believe, Jason, that that whether it's money or success, it follows the path of relationships. Oh, yeah, definitely. Without a doubt. And so if you've got the right relationship to a VC or a person with an amazing, you know, high net worth individual, they said, so listen, I love Jason. I'll, I'll, I'll put 200 grand right here. Let's go incubate this thing for six months, see what it does. That's because they believe in you because of the relationship, not because you pitch an interesting idea because they have thousands of ideas. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's just a, yeah, it's sometimes like a chicken egg thing too, right? You know, so some people like they need the money to, you know, do product development and vice versa, but it's, it's definitely that you got to have product development without a doubt. You got to right. talk to people. And so here's one thing. Um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs do this too, right? They'll build a product, build a product. Like you said, they never talk to anyone, not even about the product, but you know, they don't do any networking. They don't brand themselves. Like if you're John Bob and you have this kind of product, but they Google you and nothing comes up, like, you know, you kind of defeat your purpose, right? Right. That's exactly right. And, and, and listen, at, at a minimum in today's resume world, uh, you've got to have a decent pres presence on LinkedIn. It's not like LinkedIn is going to sell anything for you. But if the only thing I Google is you and I get to LinkedIn and I see where you've had interesting posts and you're writing about your company and your product and you put a couple of pages to get papers together, fantastic. If the next thing I see is just a, an interesting website that speaks to something, I mean, th those are like just the, the minimum, you know, cost to get involved, right? That's just this price of admission. You got to ante that up. From that, then it gets into things like this. It, you need to find about 15 Jasons and you need to be interesting enough to engage so that now you've got three podcasts with your names. You've got two local interviews that are video. You've got a local news station. And then your first page on Google is just interesting. It's not the detail. It's just that you're interesting. You're out there. You're beginning that brand. It's like, wow, that's, I want to talk to Jason because I can see he's out there. He's met a few people. I called so-and-so that lives in the same area. He's a friend of mine. He's like, oh yeah, I met Jason at this networking function. And so it's not to brown nose and be popular it's to be relevant from a relationship standpoint. And that's really hard for people that come from corporate America because corporate America folks don't network that well. Most of them are like, well, hey, I work for so-and-so, you come talk to me. <laughs> it's also hard for a um, introverted person that's an engineer that's developed an amazing product. They're like, I, I hate talking to people and I don't wanna do that. And that's why you start getting into partner conversations and how do I find someone that's my yin to the yang and how do I get my opposite engaged? But, the, the networking relationship thing, I think, is undertaught in business school and is undervalued for an entrepreneur that says, but look how cool my product is. It's giving me a bunch of money. And it, yeah. it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, I, I, like, I like to joke around that I'm an introvert, introvert. And if I can do this, then anyone can, right? This is my point of view. If I can, yeah. if I can do this, anyone can. Um, so what's, what's your advice for um, on people going to college? It's kind of off topic. Like, you know, before back in our day, you know, go to college, be successful. Now it's more like, you know, college costs have increased like 10,000%. I mean, of course, make the number up. And it, 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 it's like, unless you're like going to be a lawyer or doctor, there's yeah. a lot of people say there's no need to be go to college. But I, I agree with like, like, of course, the cost is high, but this is social networking and the people you meet is, is invaluable. So here's how I have conversations with my kids and how I've had conversations with any young person I'm talking to today. So listen, there are very few undergraduate schools that you can go to and leave in debt and it's worth it. If you want to go to Stanford, listen, man, you can get into Stanford and you can walk out of that place all networked up. It might be worth maybe, 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 maybe. But if you're going to a, a local school or a state school, whatever the case may be, and you're going to walk out of that 50 grand, 80 grand, 100 grand, 200 grand in debt. I'm like, what are you thinking? So my encouragement to young people is that obviously if you use something very specific, right? You said an attorney, a doctor, et cetera, there's a path, right? But if you're looking for general business education and engagement, uh, listen, I see there's nothing wrong with going to a good business school, local school, engaging. You're going to grow some. You're, you're going you're gonna to learn. 
but if you're 18, 19, and you've got a pretty good idea of where you want to be, like, I want to be a welder, I want to go drive it, want to work with my hands, or man, I'm a tech guy, and we're, we're hiring engineers today that aren't going to school, man, they've been coding since they were 12. If you've got a hand skill or a technical skill, uh, I think it's a fair question to have today is, do I need to go invest that money in that college education? Because if, if you're parents believe in you, let them go buy you a welding truck, go do it, get a one-year apprenticeship and walk out a welder. And you're going to be making six figures a year with your own schedule and you can do that for the rest of your life. Or let's go invest in you, send you to the right type of coding camps and get you involved in the right kind of experience. And man, you can do that the rest of your life. For all those folks in the middle, if you're not going to school and take advantage of the relationships and the time that you have there, I just don't know why I go into debt. So my kids, I'm like, listen, you want to go wherever you can that's going to be free to, to like minimal dollars. Now, grad schools, Jason, are different. If, if you could go to get a Harvard MBA and you're going to go to get Stanford MBA and go to Northwestern, those have relationships with them. If you want to go spend your money there, I get it. But, but I just wouldn't go into debt for a typical four-year degree today. Um, I, I just wouldn't do it. So Rick, next talk about this, you know, both of us are not, not like, you know, not close to 20 anymore. Yeah. But we both have the fire. Right? Talk about how you have this fire, this focus that you still want to you know, contribute to the world, add value, and how, where that comes from. I, I think part of it is that you, you start to look, and this is me looking backwards, right? Looking backwards. You can see over time, if you pause long enough, you can really see where people poured into you throughout your life. You just can't. Now, sometimes it's a father figure. It's a grandfather uh, sometimes it's a woman that you worked for that was an amazing mentor to you, but you start to see those people and then you realize they had no monetary incentive. It wasn't like they were going to you know, get something out of this. They just genuinely cared. And so there's a part of me on the people side that I'm at a stage in my career that I really want to have my fingerprints on or engage the next generation. And that's just purely from a impart my wisdom, my discernment, my knowledge that's in there. So there's a part of that. The other part of it is, I, I just don't think I'm ever going to retire. And I have been blessed so that I, my day job is also exciting to me and I love it. And I know a lot of people listening to this are like, man, you don't understand my job sucks. And I hate to do it every single day. You know, I've, I'm blessed, man. I'm coming in every day. I'm around young people. It's invigorating, man. we we got the tech thing that we're driving. It's exciting every single day. And it's, I'm going to do this the next 10, 20 years, as long as I can. So yeah. as long as the people side is there where I can give back, that gets me excited. And I'm doing something that I love to do. It's a win-win for me. And so for folks that are listening to this, gone are the days that you go work for a company for 30, 40 years, and you just clock in and clock out. I don't think you have to do that. I think you can find a network of interesting people that has interesting work and you can do that for a long period of time and be able to give back. I agree. Even when I was in the army, I did 25 years in the army, even the army, I would do my job. I would volunteer, do some different stuff. But I try to, I try to do the rocking chair thing. I, I went like batshit crazy. I, I just can't do it. I gotta, you know, I'm like, I'm gonna have to work to the, what's the saying? Uh, you're gonna work until your 10 toes up or something like that, you know? But, you know, but work is also different, right? Um, you know, early on in my career, it's much more task oriented. I mean, I had a person telling me to go do X. And then as you grow in leadership, you're now leading, but, but work is work. It's just, it's whether you're working on people or working on processes, which is kind of what I infer. I love working with people and the process is kind of the tech and things that we're doing. If you can find that type of engagement where you're being utilized and it's something that you at least like to do, Man, don't look left or right. Just go deep in that. It, just, just stay as long as you can and go drive and have fun doing that. Um, I also don't look at this as I've got to get up in the morning and do work. Now, again, I'm an owner in the company and I and people are rolling their eyes like, yeah, Rick, right, Rick, you're at the top of the food chain. But there's still real work to be done. And then when I engage in that, I want to make sure that I'm uniquely doing what only I can do. And I want to make sure that I'm engaging in a very positive, engaging way. Uh, and that's still fun for me. I still enjoy it. And then you get to nonprofits and other things and volunteering. And it's all the same thing. How can you give back to people and how can you, you know, be a part of something bigger than you? And that's really cool. So how many people are in your company right now? 
Uh, I should know the exact number. I think we're close to around 90 full-time folks, about 15 part-time and any given time, three, six interns. So about a hundred FTEs roughly. So how do you, how do you do with this as far as culture? Like of course, if your startup is you, maybe a few people, maybe five or six, whatever, it's easy to do the culture. And so you probably interview people one-on-one, the culture is good. How do you make sure the culture of those days staying the same with more and more employees coming in? I have to assume you're not interviewing everyone when they come in now, right? So how do you make sure that culture is still there that you want? Yeah, and so part of it to me is it gets back to the, the leader part of it. I met with a guy uh, yesterday, uh, has his company is called Aptigy, and they started about the same time that we did. They're a different business model, different SaaS kind of scenario, but he started out about the same time we did. We're at 100 people. He's at 400 right now. And he's just, he hired 20 people last week. It's crazy, right? The growth is just this crazy number. And we talked through that. And so what, what I try to do personally is I have to make sure that the, the vision that we have for the company and our product is clean, succinct, just very, very easy to understand. And we have to make sure that the culture is very clean and easy and basic, easy for people to understand. It's not complicated. So that when people come in, you've got your talking points and it's consistency coming in. So for me, you know, once a month, I'm in front of the organization. We do a fireside chat. I'm sharing a little bit about my heart and what we do. Uh, we're also a faith-based company. So I can share a devotion on a Monday morning to folks that are coming in and share my faith and what's important to me. Uh, I have one-on-one sessions with folks. And so there's a little piece of that that I continue to keep in front of them, but it doesn't matter how I engage. It's the same talking points. We're about winning at retail. That's what we do. We have the tools that people win at retail. We have these building blocks. It's based on this amazing, amazing platform called our marketplace. Over here's our culture. Our culture, man, is about humility and faith and giving back. And this is what it means. I mean, and you get those talking points consistently. So regardless of how many people are coming in and how you grow, everyone should be able to articulate the same two or three talking points. And you consistently show it, talk it, and live it. And that's really all I can do from my vantage point because I'm not spending, you know, one-on-one time with all 100 people, even every month. It's just not realistic. So Rick, is your company like fully remote or is everyone in Fayetteville? How does that work? Yeah, we have, I should know this number two. I think we have uh, seven people, no, not nine people that are fully remote outside of the state of Arkansas. We live in Northwest Arkansas. And then we have a hybrid workforce right now. So we're three days in the office, two days anywhere. And I would say that the two days are anywhere, probably 80% of the folks are working from home. And so obviously COVID changed that. Uh, And then we have a franchise model internationally and we're in seven other countries. And we control the brand and technology and they handle the sales, marketing and operations in those countries. So- from your point of view, has it been a plus or a challenge to have like people fully remote, some hybrid, like different working models? Do you, like, do you have a problem like somebody said, well, you do that for the remote workers, but not for us. We're not being fair or equal. Uh, I, I, th- I think a little bit. We, we use the word fair versus equal. I, I caution people. Uh, being treated equally is like the worst thing you can ever ask for. Like it, it just, it's going to be painful. You know, I was telling my, my youngest was complaining because we're, you know, helping out one of her siblings with the phone. And she's like, that's not fair. You know, I wanted you to do this. And I said, okay, we're going to help you. We're going to give you exactly what he has. Oh, I don't want what he has. I want the thousand dollar phone. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You wanted equal. Equal sounds like a $200 phone. I don't want that. I said, so be careful being equal. So that, that being said, when you look at the remote workers and, and, and how people are coming in and out, the folks are coming in the office, uh, we want to make sure that people are productive, they're engaging, and they're as healthy and doing as, as good a work as they can. I think having said that, the piece that we don't know yet, and, and Jason, this could take a year, could take five years. I think there is going to be an impact on the leadership of tomorrow, not the doers of tomorrow, the leadership of tomorrow, because they're not casually seeing Rick West the C-level people, the VP-level director people every day and how they interact because they're at home on a computer doing really, really good work. So as people need to progress up and to to lead, not being around leadership and just having phone calls, I think is going to be hard on the remote community 
when they're saying, well, why am I not the new director? I said, well, you don't necessarily have the people skills to do that. You're not really showing the leadership piece here, but here's Jason. He's still in the office, still engaging. He's learned this. I've seen him present over here. He's managing this team. He's been able to lead it. So we're going to promote him. They're like, well, yeah, but I like to do that. I said, yeah, but you stayed at home for the last three years and I'm going to reward you. I'm not going to punish you. Uh, you're going to get great work assignments, but you're not going to be that person because you're, you're not really involved in the organization to be that next leader. And I think that's going to be a real tough thing for companies to deal with in about three years. So what do you think about this? What's your opinion on this, right? So before COVID, you know, we had these middle managers, basically like, you know, quote unquote, they babysat people, make sure they did their job, whatever. COVID came, everyone went home and people proved they could work without a middle manager, sort of kind of right. Right. Do you, do you think this middle management is going to like go away, go away permanently? Is it going to come back? Or what do you think about that? I, I think it's going to be a little bit different. I think the another thing we've learned here, Jason, is that if we thought it was odd that people were changing jobs every three, four years, I think with COVID and other things, you're going to find they're going to change jobs every one or two years. It's going to be even more the rotation. So I think that middle management person is going to be much more on recruiting, onboarding, and building than it is just managing the day-to-day -day. Uh, because the turnover, I think, is going to be more significant than people think because they're like, well, so-and-so offered me a new role. Well, are you going to move to uh, Tampa? No, nah, I'm staying here. Offered me more money, I'm staying. So that whole onboarding process is going to happen, I think, happen more often. It was different three years ago because, like, gosh, I don't want to relocate to Tampa. I'm going to ignore that job. Well, that's that's not happening today. So, that entry level per, that entry level manager, that middle end management person, I think is going to have to have their hands on the constant onboarding, the constant training and development of a team, and I think it's going to have to be a different nuance than just managing tasks in front of them. I think so too. So, Rick, can you talk some about you know those B two B B two C? Is, is running a B2B or B2C like the same 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 skill set or you have to have different skill sets to do each one? Yeah, again, I'm, I'm a analogy parable concept guy, you know, the parable that um, we've seen in B2C and all of us have grown up, especially if you're in your 30s, you've grown up realizing that you should be able to click and go to cart for just about anything. I mean, you're buying batteries at Amazon, you're buying a $3,000 TV, you're going to Vroom, buying a car, and you're probably buying a house these days and sight unseen because you can click, click and buy. It's crazy, right? What you can do. So because of that B2C mentality, what we've seen in our world, which is really how we're creating our marketplace, our marketplace is allowing us to say, when you look at auditing products, which is what we do, you look at the, the research that we do, or we do ratings and reviews, we do marketing trial and sampling. Instead of an old way, of having a B2B relationship, which is, let me schedule a meeting in two weeks, let's have a couple of meetings, get everyone onboarded, put together a plan and launch something in four weeks. We're going all the way backwards saying in our B2B world, you can go to our marketplace, Jason, and in a matter of about three clicks and maybe four or five minutes, you could launch a ratings and review project, ratings and reviews for your website, across any retail or online entity in a matter of minutes. If you're an entrepreneur listening today and said, gosh, I'm trying to get this concept and I want someone to review this video of my product and tell me what they think, or I've got this visual, I want them to, to respond to that. Old school B2B would be, hey, why don't you just spend the next two or three weeks building out a plan? And I'm saying, you kidding me? Go to our marketplace, go to the product testing, upload your visuals, ask these three questions in a matter of hours, I'm going to tell you if your product sucks or not. Because it's a B2C mentality. And so for the young people listening, it's like, of course, why would I want to talk to Rick? I don't need to talk to Rick. I just need the product. The older folks, 40s and 50s are saying, yeah, but I, I want to talk to Rick and have a couple of meetings. And, and I think that, that world is going away. So we're putting all of our eggs into the B2B marketplace that we've developed that has the same frictionless environment that Amazon has created in the B2C world. And that's what you're going to find if you go to fieldagent.net and you go click on shop. You can buy things and two or three things, go to a cart, never talk to a soul, get amazing products and services.
So Rick, let's go back to your startup journey. So you've been with a, quite a few startups. Can you talk about like how you decide like maybe in one startup, start another startup? What's your process for that? Yeah, so we, at one point in time, by it was, I, know, I call it the pre-selfie days, right? So it's 2010, iPhone 3S was out. There's no front-facing camera, no video. Most people can't remember those days, but you either had a flip phone or a BlackBerry. And you may have had a second phone called an iPhone because the corporate America wouldn't let you use an iPhone because the email exchange wasn't the right type of security protocol. And so we were using these iPhone 3Ss to capture data for one of five LLCs we were managing. I had a shop a marketing company, had a brokerage, had a distribution company, had our own products and had shopper research. Had all these companies we're managing. And we're trying to figure out which one of these we could scale. And so we're using an iPhone, again, pre-selfie days, I said, I wonder if anyone is using the iPhone to capture data inside of a store or talking to people inside of their homes and asking them how they use products. And Jason, no one was doing it. Waited three months, sat around again with our iPhones, looked at the same thing. No one was doing that. We said, you know, we're going to be like those guys that said they invented Instagram, but just didn't have the time to do it. And we're talking at a party and people are just rolling their eyes at us like, oh, whatever. So we started working, again, five LLCs. We started working nights and weekends again and launched Field Agent to be the very first an app, very first app in iTunes that would pay you cash to collect data based on geolocation and metadata. Really interesting concept. Now, that was launched as a tool to solve a problem for an agency, which is getting insights and data inside of stores and homes. After about six months, we all just looked at each other and said, what are we doing here? I mean, we're never going to scale the marketing agency. We're never going to scale the research. So we get rid of everything, roll the research underneath us. My wife was running that. I kind of acquired my wife, put it underneath field agent man. And we. He being in the boardroom, convincing you to buy it. People just got it. They're like, Oh, that makes complete sense. And they just started buying it. So all that being said, you're solving a problem we're still kind of an agency feel to it. You fast forward 10 years, and now we're in that Amazon effect on B2B where we've created a really cool marketplace that allows you to buy our products. So Rick, random thought, you know, could you imagine if, you know, back in the height of BlackBerry, if someone would have said BlackBerry's going to basically go to business, no one would have believed you, right? No, I mean, not your wildest dreams. You know what? And you thought Netscape was going to get rid of Windows because it's going to take, up, take over the world. I mean, You've got a couple of those things. And man, how many of us were going to Blockbuster and buying DVDs? And so when you, you look at that, you think, ah, oh, this will never happen. If I've learned anything in my you know, career, it's less about how this business overtook the other. It's more of how the other was resistant to change. Yes. Part, yes, part exactly. of that's the, found, the founder syndrome, right? We are Blockbuster. I am king. This is what I'm going to do. I am BlackBerry. I own the market. You know, you're going to have to compete with me. And so not listening to experts and, and being able to change is, is the thing that comes back to bite you. And, and you got to be careful with that as an entrepreneur. I might be wrong, but I think Netflix actually tried to sell themselves to Blockbuster. Blockbuster said no. I want to say Blockbuster said customers enjoy the experience of leaving their home, getting the car, driving for 20 minutes, walking around the store and paying late fees, right? Of course, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, right? it was something like they offered them, they said, hey, we'll sell for like 30 million. It was like, like $30 million. Mm -hmm. These guys were struggling. They were looking for investment and they said no. Then they got the right VC and the rest is history, right? Yeah. But, but again, because the founder said, no, people are never going to do that. Jason, you want, look at all these DVD players. People aren't going to throw away their DVD players. They're going to keep having DVDs. Come on. Yep. Now never. DVDs are like the way of the VCR. Exactly, exactly. So all that being said, as, as an entrepreneur listening to this, you see where, you know, Rick and his co-founders took this company. We started out solving a problem. We had a great agency effect to make that thing work. Now we're fast forwarding. Now after 12 years, we're pivoting, but the pivot isn't on the problem we're solving because we still have tools to help you win at retail. We're not pivoting on the products that are in front of us. We've just productized them. And the platform by which you buy it is different. So we're trying to, to move along with where the industry is going. And that part's been pretty exciting. So Rick, let's change subject to something else you love. So talk about your love for UK basketball. Oh. How, you, how you think they're doing this year? And what do you think they're going to accomplish this year? 
You know, this is the, uh, if you're a basketball fan, listening, listen, uh, this is the oldest team that Coach Cal Kentucky's had since he's been there in 15 years. We actually have four people on the team that their age begins with two. What? I don't believe it. Normally, everyone's age starts with a one, ends with an eight or a nine. But we got guys that begin with two. That's really, really cool. Number number two is that uh, we, we go eight deep and we've got a couple of point guards. And man, I think based on where the team is today, uh, we will be everyone's worst nightmare in their bracket. Uh, I am confident that you'll get a final eight, final four out of it. And if they keep healthy, uh, I think we can make a really good run. So I'm feeling very bullish about this team. So I actually looked up the record. They're like 24 and six right now. Do you have to know what the, the ranking is? Uh, I think we're still around six or seven in six that range. Seven. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's what, listen, if you if you look enough for March Mattis, you you need to be like a one two seed. You get down to three and fours, so you have some tough games. So if we can keep in that eight and come out with at least a one or a two seed, we're going to be fine. Yeah, I think based on previous history, you do not want to be a five seed because then like the five seeds get get upset a lot by the number twelve. Like like what are the occurrence? It it is the wrong place to be, my friend. You do not want to be that place in the bracket. So feeling good about basketball. You know, I live here in Arkansas, and Arkansas has got a good team this year. So the SEC is going to be represented well. So what do you think about this being um the I can't say his name Mike Sosjewski the last year at Duke. I know, yeah. of course, I, of course, all the sentimental people would probably want him to win one more championship. But of course, I know you're going for Kentucky. Oh, listen, let, it's time for Coach K to go. He just go. He has enough no championships, he, right? Yeah, he's had enough championships. He can move on someplace else. Yeah. Uh, so I'm so, so guessing when Kentucky plays Arkansas, you go to see the, the you see them play in person, I'm guessing? Uh, yeah, we actually were there uh, a week ago. Jason had an amazing time. We were the we were easy to pick out. I'm sure you were. <laughs> when, when, the, when the camera would zoom around and you see a sea of red and then there's two blue, my wife and me, standing right there wearing blue they're like everyone's i saw you on tv how'd you see me because you're the ones wearing blue nice so oh, next fine. so next you, you do some stuff for the a company called i don't know how to say it but it's j-o-y-n i think they do yeah. hand basket and stuff yeah so so join so part of you know giving back if you think of your again an entrepreneur especially if you get some success behind of you and you've got some tenure what we do is try to also pour into nonprofits. Or in this case a faith-based company that are they're operating in India and they work with the marginalized. And so they come in and they take uh, indigenous threads and block patterns and build amazing purses and handbags for women. And it's not a build a handbag and it sucks and we send it out and people buy it out of you know guilt. It's not that at all. It, it's amazing products. Um, you can go to uh, joinindia.com, take a look at that, fantastic products. But, but the premise behind it is how do you take this Western business process and come into a, a, a market. In this case, it's in a Dehradun, India, uh, and near a area called Rajpur. How do you come in and work with the marginalized? So most of the women that do the block printing are from the leper colony, you know, struggle to have a job. We've got schools that we're investing in. We're investing in medical care for their kids and their families so that you can actually pour into a community so that community can be self-sustainable. So the business join, all the profits go right back into the community that keeps that community up and running. And so that's one of the areas that we try to pour into is to find folks like that. They have the heart. Uh, they've got the business idea that they probably need someone to come around them. So our team helps them with marketing. They come around with business strategy. And you want to be able to support those folks kind of half a world away. And is everything they make is handmade? All handmade. Yeah. Now, that big, there's a few machine things with some of the leather they do but it's all hand block printed uh, right there in India. And how did you find these people? Like, how did you like, I mean, of all the rent, all the people you, you found in the world, how did you have to find this group of people? Yeah. So for us, we were, we were, uh, we had a rug manufacturing, think about rug manufacturing in Tibet. So it was in a, in Yushu, China. It's the home of the Dalai Lama, the home of Kundin. So it's right there in Tibet. And we had a group there that from a ministry standpoint, where we're supporting the calm Tibetans. And so you've got the Tibetans, Dalai Lamas, the calm Tibetans, and really were marginalized and, and tried to get pushed out. And so as we started to work with the calm Tibetans in China, what we started to realize was that a tremendous amount of them have migrated to India so that they no longer face religious persecution. So he had a ton of calm Tibetans in India. So the rug company was doing okay, but wasn't something we could scale. 
So we took that machine, then went into India to follow the calm Tibetans to India and really started working with them. Now, we're big enough now that it's not just calm Tibetans. It's, you know, the Indian people that are local, but we're really focusing on that community. And what you'll find is that if you bring in a great work environment, you pay a fair wage, and you bring in the, the morals and ethics of having the work environment that's a place you want to come in every day and you take care of employees, you know, we got people standing out the door that will come work for you. And so that's a good problem to have, but it's also the worst problem to have, right? You've got 300 employees, but you really need a bunch more, but you only have so much volume. So we continue to grow and continue to hire more people. So Rick, that's making another good point. You know, those people out there who will say, no one wants to work anymore. They won't get the free stimulus check. You know, they want to work, you know, get paid $20 an hour. Other people know we want to work. We're not going to work for like, you know, no pennies anymore, right? right. How do we solve this disconnect? No, I, th I think in, in fairness to, again, I'm, I'm not an industry guy to tell you what the restaurant industry looks like or what the retail industry looks like. But listen, there's some fairness to getting pushed on wages. But you and I both know, if you're a math guy or an economics person, um, raising everyone's wages tomorrow, not everyone's making a fortune. So the, the price is going to go up and inflation hits and there's all kinds of problems. Now, that being said, in our world, as we look at trying to entice people to come in, uh, we're not chasing people um, to try to convince them to come in and work. I want to find that the people that want to make a difference, that want to be a part of something bigger than themselves, and I'm going to make sure that they're compensated well, better than average, right? Really, really well. Uh, I want to make sure that their work environment is amazing. And there's, you know, 100 companies that are going to do the same thing. The question we have to answer is, but within our work environment and our culture, can we help them work to be a part of something bigger than themselves? So the bigger than themselves is the technology fun part about you know creating these tools to win at retail. And then there's the faith page part of it. How can I be a part of helping the community and, and being a part of this, this amazing environment that we've created here? So I don't know if we're gonna fix it tomorrow. If you're a engineer, a software engineer, man, it, I think you're gonna to continue to see salaries to skyrocket. But listen, Jason, we both know the, the pendulum swings, right? So I think it's going to swing back a little bit. But I think we've got to a point where we've made enough of a wage change that, that I think it's a, it's, a, it's a new normal. I don't see it going backwards. So, Rick, so your platform is a tech-based platform, right? You have engineers working on it? Yeah, listen, we've got, um, I don't know, 12, 15 full-time engineers plus some other tech guys that are working on it. We've got... Uh, the good news for us is we started everything in the cloud, so we're not having to undo things from a service standpoint. So everything's cloud-based, all relatively straightforward in what we're doing. And so it's a tech platform that's amazing. Then we have operations, obviously, and sales marketing folks that are doing all the pieces that are that, that are in front of us. So, you know, I'm sure you know this, like there's a lot of new developers out there. You know, they go to Coding Academy. The Coding Academy, you know, take this six-month boot camp, get a $5,000 a year job, which is not true. So a lot of junior developers are struggling to find their first job. From your point of view, what's your advice to them to get that first position? I think it's, it's a couple of things. When we look at resumes, let's look at engineers versus a just a person with skin in business. If you're a business person, it's getting a job anywhere. The fact that, listen, I can teach you what to do. I just want to make sure you're a worker. And when we try to hire people, let me tell you, the two best people in the world to hire is a kid that's worked on a farm or a kid that's a swimmer. Because, you know, they get up early, they're dedicated, they, they, they get things done, and they are working machines, man. The second thing you look for is someone that's a reader. If you're in an interview and you ask someone what the last thing they read, says, well, I read these two blogs and I follow people on Twitter, anyone I'm looking for. But if you can find a reader, you know you got a learner. Then you find someone and said, well, what are you involved in? Well, you know, I'm doing Xbox over here and I'm doing this. Oh, no. Or you find someone that says, hey, I'm involved in these two groups. I help out over here. So if I can find a worker that has uh, an interest in learning and they got somebody that's involved in things, that's a great business person. I do the exact same thing over here if you're a software engineer. Same analogy, right? I can find someone that, man, is just really, really a good worker that has some sort of work background. And I want to find someone that has created four business models on their own. They've developed three apps for friends. They've got this spreadsheet they created over here. And they've got four websites for their aunts and uncles to do whatever. I mean, I want to find people that are engaged in some way. 
And I also want to find someone over here that's not just looking at their education saying, okay, what am I learning here? But are they involved in the three networking organizations on campus? Are they attending non-college or non-university um, uh, events as it related to the tech startup you know, scene? So if I can find people that are interested, if I can find those people, then I don't have to look at GPAs. I don't have to look at their education where they went. I'm going to find workers that want to learn that are interested in the business. And if I can find those guys, JCB is probably what we pay them because I yeah. know they know how to work and I know they're learners and I know they're interested in the space. And that's what I'm looking for. So Rick, how, how, excuse me, how's the tech startup thing in, in Fayetteville? Is there like a tech startup scene there, a world there? Yeah, there, there really is. Now it's not as, um, it's not like an Austin to have the volume there, but we've got the, the startups, the incubators, the the coffee shops that you go to that has that feel and that vibe to it. Uh, there's a handful of startups here that have received Series A's and B's. So the investment community is starting to see that uh, even though we're a flyover state, uh, okay. it's important. Uh, what you'll also find is that from a, a networking standpoint, uh, there's really, really good environments for you to be in uh, just to attend and compare notes and get involved. So I would give it a B, B plus, get close to A minus. It's, it's really getting there and it's only going to get better. So Rick, I might be viewing this wrong, but in your bio that I said, it says Rick is an eight wing seven. What does that mean? All right. Well, there's a thing called an Enneagram. It's like a personality test. And so the personality test is you've got like Myers-Briggs, like you're an ESTJ, I'm an ESTJ, or you have, you know, other type. And this one is, um, you have like eight different or nine different wings that you're, you could be. And so I'm a um, uh, eight wing seven. So the eight says, and this is my daughter picking on me a little bit. Uh, I'm the guy that pushes back. Okay. So I'm the guy that continues challenge. So the eight is called a challenger. So I challenge, 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 challenge. But when I'm really, really healthy and I'm at my best as a challenger, I'm an amazing, compassionate helper. Okay. And so that's kind of where that eight and seven get in. So I'm a good guy to be around, but when I get unhealthy and I'm stressed out, I'm just pushing real hard. But when I get really, really healthy, I'm engaging others. So that's why the eight wing seven kind of popped in there for those that, are, that understand what the Enneagram is. And how long have you known this? It's something you recently found out. Have you known about this for a long time? Yeah. You know, if, you, if you're Myers-Briggs, I've, I've known the, I'm an ESTJ on the Myers-Briggs since I was probably in my early 20s. And again, extrovert guy and a little bit judgmental and I push back. And so I know my strength is really, really good. But if I use it too much, it's a bad thing. So I use the, the parable example. There's a, uh, a parable in scripture that talks about the sower and they, they sow these seeds and some seeds fall, fall on you know rough soil and the birds take it away and some seeds fall but man there's all kinds of weeds growing around you got to cut the weeds down some seeds fall and they just need to be nourished because the soil's not that healthy and some seeds fall in great soil and so i use that that parable my go-to is the weed eater chainsaw i'm a one hammer guy so i come in and said hey jason i'm going to spend all my time encouraging you but my way to encourage you is a big weed eater here's what you're doing wrong you can do this you why don't you try this and try that now, the other extreme is, hey, he just needs to be nurtured. Hey, you're doing a great job, Jason. You keep at it, man. You're the best at what you do. So those two extremes are really unhealthy, right? Because if you understand agricultural, you know, in ag world, too much fertilizer and water kills a plant. Too much sweet stuff, right? And too much weeding, you, sometimes you've got to let the plant kind of grow because you end up cutting the plant while you're trying to cut things down. So that long-winded story gets into... I've got to be careful because I've known this all my life. I'm a challenger. I get in there. I know what's right. I'm a knower. And I've got to be cautious, especially at my role at this time in my career. My words weigh a thousand pounds. I've got to make sure I'm also an encourager and someone that can uplift as opposed to someone just constantly getting in with that chainsaw, trying to, to get rid of the distractions and help you focus. So Rick, you know, you know, faith is important to you. You serve as an elder at your, at your local church. Can you talk about how we know man of faith, you know, affects your business decisions? How being a man of faith is so important to you and, and the business you're growing and the life you lead? 
Yeah, yeah. So you have, you know, obviously you've got people looking at someone that can say, oh my gosh, if he's a Christian guy, I have a stereotype. If he's not a Christian guy, I got a stereotype over there. And so when I use the word faith, my faith as, as a believer coming into what I do, my organization, whether you're an outside person looking in or a team looking in, they realize that Rick's principles and how he lives his life is very, very consistent. Believing in people, the morals of our company and what we do, how we treat people, how we give, how we encourage, and that's in our DNA and everything we do. Now, I just happen to be working for a Jewish carpenter called Jesus, but that's that's this piece over here, right? But what the outsider should look at, even though they may not be a person of faith, they can realize that that Rick and his organization is consistent. They're givers. They give back. It's an amazing place to work. Okay. They do really, really good work. They, you know, they're encouraging each other, and it's a place to develop folks. So my faith comes into work not to proselytize. My faith comes into work to show that I don't put that outside and become a chainsaw guy all day long, just ripping people up all the time. Because my faith comes in and says, whoa, 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 whoa. Jason's having a hard day. There's no reason to hit him with a chainsaw today. What he really needs is some, some encouragement. Now, people would say, well, Rick, faith doesn't have anything to do with it, just being a good person. And, and you could go down that path. But our, our morals, our values, and who we are is very much based in that faith-based culture. So that's what I bring in every single day. And I want people to see the consistency. It's not a show. It's not something I do in one day and the other day I don't. It's very, very consistent in who I am and what we do. Hence the be a part of something bigger. You got to be something bigger from a technology standpoint and you can't be focused on self. You've got to be focused on others and the faith part helps us do that. Rick, can you talk about how data insights are changing e-commerce? Yeah, so when you look at the, the, the e-commerce world that we live in today, you could argue, hey, just follow the cookies, right? And if you, it's all creepy, right? Everything you click, somebody else has clicked yeah, on you. Yeah, right? I, don't, I don't think the, the average American realizes how creepy it is. It is creepy, but what it doesn't do, and, and I think regardless of who you're talking to, uh, it doesn't tell you the why. Okay, I saw what you did, but I don't know why you did that. So what we do, you know, we come alongside to say, hey, Jason, the next time you're shopping, you may kind of record what you're doing, but I want to know why you go a certain place. I don't know why you went there and how that played out. So we think that insights are going to continue to impact e-commerce because it's going to give you more of a why. And I think you're going to have a better product understanding the why versus just what someone does. And I think that's really, really important, especially for the entrepreneurs if you don't have a good UI UX person, at a minimum, you've got to get a good research person that can help you ask hard questions and understand why someone does something because you'll design your product differently, understanding the why versus, hey, they always click from page A to page B. So that's what we're going to do. If you don't understand the why, you might be missing something really, really big. Yeah, that's another good, great point. So many people don't realize the importance of a great UX UI person. Like it's almost like a I mean, I, I'm saying it has to be like your first one or two hours, but man, you need a, some kind of designer sooner than later. You got to find it because that's a key differentiation. Because if you look at friction, getting rid of friction on websites and making people feel like, ah, oh, that was just a good experience, man, that doesn't happen by accident. And just the, the small difference have a, a button at the top left, like maybe bottom right, you know, different hue of color. All those things are so important. And I, I think so many people don't realize the importance of it really does. So Rick, you, you already talked about your company some, but can you go in more detail, like where, how the, the company came about, your idea, how it got started, what you're focused on now, and what you see the future of your company? Yeah, so we, we talked a little bit about the, you know, the pre-selfie days when we, we talked about solving that problem at retail. And uh, it was really getting data at retail. And so what we've transitioned into is that um, our app allows everyday people to collect data or be kind of mystery shoppers or secret shoppers. So I'm one of the few people on your show, Jason, that can pay people money. If you download our app and you answer a few questions, go to a store, take some pictures, I'm going to pay you cold, hard cash. No points, no badges. You'll never be the mayor or field agent. And I'm going to pay you cash to do something. So that's number one. Number two, because of the 2 million downloads we have and the hundreds of thousands of people engaging every single day and doing tasks for us. Because of that, 
I can provide amazing data, as in auditing a price, can tell me if, if a display is up in a store or show me how you use something inside of your home. I can provide amazing insights because instead of asking Rick or Jason what they think about the baby aisle and baby food, I'm going to send in a mother of two because her opinion makes a whole lot more sense than Jason's and a whole lot more sense than Rick's because she's going to give you a mother's perspective or a female 18 to 35 that goes to the cosmetic aisle. That's really important to get insights of mystery shopping. And because the business we have, since we're engaging those shoppers, we can also have them buy your product, try your product, and either write a ratings and review, tell a story, kind of a research standpoint, or share something kind of a from a social media standpoint and become a micro influencer for you. So that's the amazing work that we do day in and day out. Now, the marketplace we have, again, you can go to fieldagent.net, go shop. And when you go shop, you can see, gosh, I can actually click, click and get a ratings and review, click, click, check a price, or I can click, click and do a sample, all this stuff's in front of you. Once we started to expand this, our clients are saying, Jason, hey, Rick, I'd buy more from you if you did other things. So our marketplace is becoming broader and we're adding third-party products in there. So now we're offering merchandising services so we can actually change something on the shelf. We're offering photography services for people that need amazing photos for their website or for brand photography. We're offering e-commerce solutions on how you can find ratings on a page and again, ratings review, things like that. So our marketplace is broadening in the solutions we provide for people that want to win at retail, but the technology and platform is still the same strong marketplace that we developed some years ago. So, so Rick, who's like your, your, your target customer and, and how do you make money? So a couple of things. We, it's the, the big middle would be brands. So if you're a, a Unilever PNG craft, if you're a brand, you probably have used us or are currently using us today to either find out something in a store because you don't want to fly all over the country, understanding what shoppers think about products, or you're sampling something and doing some sort of trial. We also have retailers who say, hey, I want people to shop my store and I want you to tell me what you think and engage my associates and do mystery shopping. On the other side, we have agencies that work with brands and small companies and hey, we want to help our brands look better and do things better. Quick serve restaurants, the number of pizzas, we've given way more beer and pizza than you can imagine. Uh, people say, go to this restaurant, buy this beer, tell me what you think, how was it served to you, what did it look like? Go to this quick serve restaurant, buy this pizza, order these toppings, what did you think, how was it delivered to you? And then from an entrepreneur standpoint, research, we have a ton of entrepreneurs that are saying, gosh, I can't afford an agency, I just can't. I'm not going to drop 20, 30 grand, but I'll spend two or 300 bucks with Rick and I'll send my concepts out and I'll get real people that I don't know, giving me their opinions about my products. And so we really do anyone that has a product or a service is a potential client. The big ones are CPG brands and, and restaurants and quick serve restaurants. And the tertiary guys are agency and startups and retailers on the other side. Rick. Is there anything I should have asked you that I haven't or anything else you want to talk about? No, I, I think part of it for me, because again, I take every audience to sell. If, if you're an entrepreneur, you sell, right? So you can be in selling mode. Um, I want to encourage the listeners out there today is that, listen, if you've got a really good product or a service, I'd love to come alongside your listeners right now and be of help to them. You'd be surprised how quickly someone could reach out to me on LinkedIn and I'd reply back and how can I help out and give a little bit of love. Uh, so again, I want to kind of live that out with them, but also from a product standpoint, um, it's too easy to spend 10, 20, 50, 200 bucks to get real information. And so I want to come alongside them as well. As a matter of fact, I'd love to, to make them an offer if I can. Yes, 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 definitely. So if you're listening today um, and you want to reach out and do something within the field agent app or not field agent app within our, our field agent marketplace, engage, play around, look at the marketplace, and I will come alongside you guys and give you a little bit of love. So I'll give you 10 free people. You can talk to 10 people just for kicks. They'll be strangers. They won't be your mom and dad, and I will help you out. All you got to do is either DM me directly on LinkedIn or go directly to our website and go to fieldagent.net, engage there, and go to info, put in your information, say, hey, Rick told me he'd give me 10 free concept tests. 
all day long, talk to 10 strangers. So I'll help you out. So Rick, can you share your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Yeah. So again, so for us, the easiest place for me is LinkedIn. I'm a LinkedIn guy, big believer in that. And so I think I'm Rick West 01 on LinkedIn, but you can't miss it. Rick West field agent. You're going to find me real quick. I think for us, the best place to go and to live and to breathe is to go right to our marketplace. It's sort of like uh, Amazon's not too worried about their Facebook page. Amazon's not too worried about learn LinkedIn. So you go directly to Amazon and learn. I want you to go directly to our marketplace. So go to fieldagent.net, fieldagent.net. You'll learn about us. Click on the shop. It goes right in. You'll get a good feel for who we are. But obviously, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that kind of fun stuff, as well as Field Agent Inc. And to listeners, we have the link to his gift, a resource, and your social media on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cavernishhlblog.com. Be sure to share this episode with your friends, and uh, be sure to rate uh, and review and subscribe to Jason Cabinet's Jason Cabinet's experience. So, Rick, we're kind of into our talk. Can you give us any wisdom or advice on anything you want to talk about? Yeah, I, I think for the the folks who are listening today, and this is my encouragement to you as an individual as well as an entrepreneur. I, and you can even tell people that Rick West told you this. Remember, being successful is probably the least of your worries. You'll be successful at something. Being significant is really hard. Well, hey, look, I launched this product and I was successful launching it. I'm like, okay, anyone can launch a product. You want to be significant? Is it selling without you? Have you scaled it? Do you have a team that's believing in what you're doing? Do you have a following? I mean, significance is different than being successful because almost anyone listening to your show can spend a little bit of money, create something and push it out there. It, okay, that's great. Significance ties to relationships. It causes the impact. So that's my encouragement to your folks that are out there. Do something that allows you to be significant. And you're not going to be significant until you push it out. And when you find something that someone's willing to pay you for, look out, man, because you're going to make an impact on the world. Rick, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, man. You bet. And to listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.